They say nothing in life is free, and it's pretty true. So when I ask you guys to support the show, I don't expect you to do it for nothing. If you support the series by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast, you'll get lots in return. Subscribe for free episode guides and you get a fully referenced transcript of the show with images and maps. Subscribe for extra podcasts and you'll get lots of exclusive audio content available only to you, the patrons, the people who support the show and make sure it comes out. I'm really thankful to everyone who supports the Great Famine series. And the next exclusive audio content that patrons will receive is coming out in early July and it's actually a full audiobook. To thank patrons for their ongoing support and give you guys a better sense of your history, I'm going to record the first and only ever audio version of the 1850 publication An Emigrant's Narrative, A Voice from Steerage. This is the account of a man called William Smith who travelled on an emigrant ship with Irish famine emigrants to New York in the winter of 1847 and told his experiences of that voyage with these desperate people fleeing starvation. His story also chronicles how they were treated when they landed at Staten Island. I've chosen this book for two reasons. Firstly, because it's a really great story written by someone who actually experienced these events. But also, given I will soon be moving on to the story of emigration, this will give you guys an extra level of depth. So don't miss out on this audiobook. To get yours, sign up at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. That's patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. To start each show, I always thank patrons. And in this episode, I want to shout out to Paul Cooney, who's been a great supporter of the show. Thanks very much, Paul. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dwyer and this is The Great Famine Part 9, Insurrection and Starvation, A Tale of Two Towns. The best way I can introduce this podcast is bizarrely enough, a quote from the Soviet dictator, Joseph Stalin, who reputedly once quipped, if one man dies of hunger, that is a tragedy, if a million die, that's only statistics. If and when Stalin ever actually said this has been disputed, but there's no denying there is truth behind the chilling statement. We all ultimately understand the loss of one person, but we struggle to relate to large numbers no matter how poignant their plight is. This is very relevant in terms of today's episode, which brings you through the winter of 1846, when what had been a serious crisis in Ireland explodes into a full-blown famine. While the figure of one million deaths is often bandied around in terms of the Great Irish Famine, this does little to explain the experiences of those who lived through these terrible times. The victims and their stories are often reduced to faceless numbers, stripped of their own identities as we struggle to envisage the horrors that they endured. So it was bearing Stalin's chilling quote in mind that I approached what is one of the darkest periods of the Great Famine. I have tried to veer away from large impersonal statistics and focused on something more tangible, hopefully something easier for you guys to relate to. So this episode therefore looks at two communities, Yall in East Cork and Skibbereen in West Cork. These were very different towns and experienced the horrors of famine in very different ways and this is an important aspect of the story. The Great Famine varied massively from place to place and while there are too many individual stories to recount, these varied experiences from Cork should give you a sense of life at the time. The first half of this episode looks at life in Yall, where the people, due to local circumstances, were in a position to fight against starvation, and indeed launched an insurrection of sorts in the autumn of 1846. The second half of the podcast is a more well-known story, that of Skibbereen in West Cork, which was devastated by the Great Famine in the winter of 1846. Before we start by visiting Yall, it's worth spending 60 seconds to recount the major developments in the series so far, which frame the following stories. So we have seen how the potato crop failed in 1845, but that a major crisis was averted, in part, by British government intervention under Robert Peel. 
while many people in Ireland experienced serious starvation, everyone had looked to the oncoming harvest of 1846 as their saving grace. However, in August that year, the entire potato crop was more or less lost after the blight struck again. This left somewhere in the region of 3 million people without food. Major intervention was needed. However, a new government, led by Lord John Russell and the Liberal Party, decided to stop food imports into Ireland, save in the extreme West. They were doctrinaire supporters of the free market and believed the government should not be involved in trade, but that if they were left to it, private businesses would be able to alleviate the famine. Their strategy focused around organising major relief works where the poor could earn money to buy food from private merchants. Underpinning this and something that is crucial in terms of our story is that the government of the day under the Liberal Party were absolutely adamant that food exports from Ireland would continue. There would be no port closures. The market would not be interfered with. So we begin today in the port of Yall in September 1846 after the entire potato crop had been more or less lost that year. Yall is a pretty poor town situated at the mouth of the Blackwater River in County Cork. Beyond the town is Whiting Bay, which bends in an arc for 15 kilometres along the south coast of Ireland. While it is picturesque, Yall has always been overshadowed by its neighbours. With the major ports of Cork City and Waterford City no more than 40 kilometres along the coast in either direction, Yall has never played a central role in Irish history. That said, it has its own fame to claim, something that was pretty relevant in the 1840s. The town's most famous, but perhaps not its favourite son, was the English colonist Walter Raleigh, who settled here in the late 16th century and was actually twice mayor of the town in the 1580s. Some of you might have heard of Raleigh, who became internationally famous as he was also an early coloniser in the Americas and among the first Europeans to venture up the Orinoco River. According to legend and folklore, it was Raleigh who first introduced the potato to Ireland, bringing it ashore when he returned to Yall after one of his several transatlantic voyages. Few could have foreseen at the time that this exotic vegetable was about to transform Ireland, but over the following centuries it was central to the massive population growth across the island. Indeed, by 1841 Yall was a much changed place since Walter Raleigh's day, in part thanks to the potato its population had grown to over 9,900 people. Five years later, in the autumn of 1846, the potato was again transforming the port's fortunes. While the almost total failure of the crop in the late summer of 1846 was leading to terrible starvation across Ireland, it was creating huge tensions in the port of Yall. Due to a curious accident of geography, the people of Yall and the surrounding areas were able to fight the famine better than most and indeed by October that year the Cork examiner referred to the town as being in a state of insurrection, an insurrection against famine. Located at the mouth of the Blackwater, Yall had long been a hub for exports from the surrounding region. The river, which rises in the distant Mutterark Mountains, flows through the Cork towns of Mallow and Fermoy before turning south crossing the county boundary into Waterford then through the towns of Capaquin and Lismore, before it eventually flows into the sea at Yall. If you've signed up for episode guides at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast, there are maps with all these towns and the river marked on them. The river and its tributaries are surrounded by rich farmland and as the harvest was brought in in 1846, large shipments of food began to flow down the black water to Yall from where they were due to be exported. The British government had made it clear they would do everything in their power to allow merchants to continue exporting food if they so wished, and larger farmers saw this as a green light to export grain, even though millions were starving since the potato crop had been lost. For the starving poor, who lived along the banks of the Blackwater, watching barges known as lighters carrying wheat, oats and other grains down to Yall for export would eventually prove too much. Each shipment meant less food in Ireland and as grain grew more scarce, the price of food then began to rise. Unsurprisingly, the port became increasingly tense. 
tensions in the Aul began to seriously ratchet up from mid-September 1846. While Ireland was no stranger to political meetings, the large numbers that dragged themselves to a meeting in the town on the 15th of September had an urgency, perhaps even a desperation, previously unseen. If something wasn't done and fast, many of these people would not live to see 1847. If food was allowed to continue to be exported and the price of food at home continued to rise, they would be priced out of the market. The crowds gathered in Yall that day listened to speeches in an event chaired by a local slater called Patrick McGrath. They then passed a series of resolutions calling on the rich of the town to sort out employment from the Board of Works and to inform the Lord Lieutenant of their plight. The demand for employment from the Board of Works was part of a government strategy to provide work so the poor could buy food. This is covered in detail at the end of the last episode. Remarkably, given the desperation and hunger among the crowd, there was no trouble. Journalists, and indeed some of the speakers, applauded the peaceful nature of those gathered. But hungry people can only tolerate so much. However, the rich in Yall failed to heed the message and appeared to have done little in the following days to alleviate starvation. A week later, on September the 22nd, large crowds again thronged into Yall. However, the mood had changed somewhat. This was a full seven days later, and having survived off scraps of food and watched their children go hungry, the poor were no longer in a mood for compromise or false promises. Initially, the gentry did manage to assuage their worries and fears, and the crowd dispersed. But whatever happened in the intervening hours, we will never know, but at three o'clock in the afternoon, large crowds began to reassemble, and they were not interested in more speeches. The mood had changed and the time for action had come. Driven on by desperate hunger, but yet in a town where shipments of food arrived on a daily basis, the poor would tolerate no more. They broke in and raided the bakeries in the town and took a large supply of bread before the authorities could do anything. They then took action over one of their primary concerns, the soaring price of food propelled by exports of the recent harvest. To tackle this issue, they marched east across the bridge that spanned the black water, connecting both sides of the river. The final section of the bridge was known as the drawbridge, a segment which could be raised like a drawbridge of old to allow ships pass up the river. The crowd raised the bridge and then threw the ratchets needed to lower it again into the black water. This would temporarily at least stop food being brought into the town from the lands on the east bank. Eventually, the authorities responded by bringing a detachment of cavalry onto the streets of Yall, but the situation had calmed somewhat by the time they arrived. The rich now demanded that the town bakers start making large amounts of food to quell any possibility of another riot, but having already suffered a raid on their premises, the bakers refused in fear that the poor would simply rob what they made again. While raids and riots like this were not unheard of, what made the all somewhat different in the autumn of 1846 was that the authorities now found it almost impossible to quell what would be in time called an insurrection. Indeed, what had just happened was only the beginning. That night, tensions in the surrounding countryside were palpable. For all the wealthy farmers, the appearance of bonfires across the hills around the all was an ill omen. You can imagine the nervous feeling as they looked out from their big houses and seeing the hills alight that night. While they may not have known exactly what it meant, you didn't have to be a genius to figure out it related to the protests of the previous day. Around the hills that night, the starving poor were indeed planning action. Large crowds were assembling and they were determined no more food would be exported through y'all. While the economists, politicians and men of letters in London could not comprehend interfering with the free market, the poor in the villages and countrysides surrounding the port of Yall cared little for this ideology that was starving them. Their bottom line was food. They adopted a strategy that was direct and on a sound footing. If the British government refused to close ports, they would do it themselves by stopping farmers and merchants from exporting food. They would have little option then but to sell it locally, which would in turn drive the price of food down. In some cases, they were even planning to rob the grain shipments. As if in a timely warning of what was at stake, the first deaths from famine took place in Yall around this time. 
Over the following days, the situation got even more volatile when a court hearing only a few miles outside of Yall had to be suspended as a riot broke out against the local landlord. Huge crowds had gathered at the court and focused their anger on Lord Stuart de Dacies, the local landlord and lieutenant of County Waterford. He was attacked after he had claimed that a wage of ten pence a day was enough for the poor, and rumours circulated he had only given five pounds to a local relief fund. The Dacey only escaped with his life after a squadron of mounted hussars attacked the crowd and a man named Power, who was a leading figure in the protest, was struck with a sabre. Lord Stuart de Dacey's would later deny he had made the remarks that had sparked this protest and claimed it was as a result of a personal grievance. This seems unlikely. The following day, Thursday, September the 25th, tensions continued to grow when a large crowd of thousands marched on a mill owned by a certain Mr. Fisher and, in the words of one newspaper, vowed vengeance if Indian meal was not sold for one shilling per stone and corn for one penny per stone. The mob then marched to a spot known locally as Ferry Point where local ferrymen transported the grains across the river and warned them not to carry any more grain. Several farmers in the locality were also warned not to take supplies to the market in Yall. The protests were now starting to have a major impact on the functioning of the port and the export trade. This provoked a major response. Word was sent down to the British naval base at Hall Bolan outside Cork City and within hours a steamship, the Myrmidian, towed two gunboats into Yall Harbour crammed with marines and gunners. Their mission, according to the Cork examiner, was simple to protect the shipping interests of that port, which in effect meant they would force the export food at gunpoint. The arrival of this military force had an effect and according to one source it seemed to deter the country boys and they returned to their homes. Backed by the navy in the coming days the local gentry fought back against the starving poor. This saw Sir Richard Musgrave and Lord Stuart de Dacies lead a party of marines from the Myrmidian up the Blackwater to take back a vessel carrying corn which had been stopped. They sallied up with a 12-pounder gun in a launch. Although successful, this act provoked major retaliation from the local people who were now threatening a wholesale raid on Yall to get the food back. The military and the police were called out and a major standoff developed as a siege-like situation ensued. Inside the town, shopkeepers prepared for the worst as they closed their premises. While the local clergy did convince the people to return home, the merchants of Yall finally took notice of the terrible suffering of the poor both inside and outside the town. In a meeting held that very day, they resolved to lobby the government to establish a grain depot in the town. This was highly unlikely, and while an application was made in early October, it was rejected. The merchants did, however, realise they were threading a fine line by continuing to export food and signs began to appear outside some shops informing the public that the owners were selling their grain exclusively on the home market. On that same day, Thursday the 25th of September, riders were also dispatched to buy thousands of barrels of Indian corn. To an extent, the insurrection had worked. This grain was initially sold at a loss of 50% at half a penny per stone. However, the people were still starving, and as a terrifying winter drew closer with September, passing away into the darker, wetter days of October, the struggle over exports did continue. On October the 3rd, large amounts of corn were waiting export at Tallow, a small town 15 kilometres northwest of Yall. The easiest way to get this grain to the two merchant vessels waiting in Yall Harbour was down the Bride River, which then flowed into the Blackwater. There could be no doubt the crews must have been extremely nervous moving shipments of grain through starved and unsettled communities on either side of the river bank. Nevertheless, they managed to travel safely along the Bride River, passing under Camp Fear Bridge, the most logical spot for an ambush, and successfully made it to the broad expanses of the Blackwater. However, they were scarcely a few miles down the Blackwater at Coneen Mill when they were confronted by what was reported as thousands gathering along the river banks, threatening to stone the boats if they did not return. The corn shipments were forced back up river, while the merchant vessels in Yall remained unloaded. While over a dozen people were arrested and taken to Waterford Jail for this incident, it's easy to see why people were engaged in such action. Grain started to rise in price everywhere except Yall, where protests were keeping the prices down. As the early days of October passed on, 
the insurrection in Yall began to change as major relief works were started in the area under the Liberal government's plans to alleviate famine. As I said earlier, the idea behind these works was to provide employment so the poor then would have money to buy food from private merchants. Like so many British government policies during the famine, it was theoretically a good idea, but when implemented, it was laced with problems. The Board of Works had already been employing hundreds around Yall, but on October the 6th, a new plan was drawn up to give 700 men employment. The works themselves were often pointless, but backbreaking. One project saw labourers lower a hill on the road between Yall and Calais. While this arguably did serve a purpose, they often had to build completely unneeded roads that led nowhere. The money to pay for these works came in the form of loans from the British government but had to be paid back in the following years by taxes levied on the wealthier citizens of Yall. On Saturday the 11th of October all older schemes of the Board of Works were wound up and the new plan to hire 700 men was due then to begin on Monday the 12th. However, thousands turned up in Yall looking for work on that day and the situation was completely chaotic so nothing happened until the following morning. It was only at this point that the men on the works were informed that they were only going to be paid at a rate of 10 pence per day. Outraged at what were clearly starvation wages in the most literal sense of the word, they immediately went on strike, refusing to work. Even those who wanted to work were forced to down tools. Led by John Hurley, a young local man nicknamed the Peddler, the labourers marched into the centre of Yall and congregated outside the Devonshire Arms, a pub named after one of the largest landlords in the region, the Duke of Devonshire. When they could not find the officials from the Board of Works, they left to go home. The following day, the overseers tried to restart the works at the rate of 10 pence a day again. However, the labourers still refused, and this time they marched through the countryside, spreading word of their protests. The authorities in Yall now became extremely worried and braced themselves for a serious outbreak of rioting. Soldiers were drafted in from Cork and arrests were made of labourers who were demanding higher wages across the surrounding countryside. Elsewhere, things were even more serious. Not far away in Clon William, in South Tipperary, the stewards in charge of a public works scheme there were fired upon. At Yall, however, the officials of the Board of Works, backed up by the army, held a line against the starving poor. By the 21st of October, the Conservative publication, the Kerry Evening Post, jubilantly proclaimed, We are sincerely happy to find that the misguided people of Yall have been induced to see the wickedness as well as the inutility of their recent strike for higher wages. How exactly the strike was broken is not clear. Perhaps it was just the presence of the soldiers in the town, but in the coming weeks Yall became a much more peaceful and sedate place. The major period of harvest exports was over, so there was few protests against shipments of food, while the labourers had been defeated in the strike over wages. However, peace was not justice. The wages being paid were too low for some to survive. All too many would not live out the coming winter. By early December the situation was increasingly dire. A report from Yall said, What heart would not be softened to compassion at the sight of the pallid faces and despairing countenances of these creatures going to their desolate homes to mingle their tears with their unfortunate wives and children, father and mothers. I have seen persons from the mountainous districts who told me they were three days fasting, trudging almost lifeless into town, unable to bear the weight of their emaciated frames to get two or three pounds of Indian meal for three days' subsistence. The grim conclusion to the report stated that of the proof of the extent to which death is caused by these privations, our correspondent refers to the quantity of coffins sold which never before were in so much request. The growing desperation in Yall was undoubtedly exacerbated by the fact that there was no workhouse in the town. One would be built in the later years of the famine, but this was no comfort to the people in 1846. The approach of Christmas that year was nothing but miserable. Newspapers continued to advertise luxury goods for those who could afford them. However, for the starving poor who peered into the shop of merchants like E. Purdens in Yall, who had received a special Christmas shipment of first-class tea and aromatic coffee, this was almost taunting them. All they wanted was the most basic of foods to survive. As the festive season approached, many were increasingly focused on death 
rather than life. But however dire the conditions in Yall were, by December 1846 there were parts of Cork that were far, far worse. The people of Yall had fought against famine because they were able to. Ultimately the merchants of the region had been forced to put up some money in what was a wealthy region. In the far west of County Cork, the people there were by and large far poorer. Next we will move the story west to the town of Skibbereen, where the people there had a very different experience to Yall. But given this is one of the longest shows I've made in a long while, I think we could all do with a quick break. As a county, Cork varies greatly between east and west. While Yall and the Blackwater Valley in the east boast some of the best land in Ireland, West Cork is more mountainous and less fertile. It's also pretty remote. Some parts, such as Mizzen Head, are 125 kilometres west of Cork City. However, that said, by virtue of several ports, the region is by no means as cut off as parts of Mayo, which I have covered in the series. This coastline is pockmarked with places like the fishing port of Union Hall, Baltimore, the village after which the US city is named, and then, in the far west, the towns of Skull and Crookhaven. Again, I've maps on Patreon for those of you who have subscribed to episode guides. They're available at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Now, the famine in this part of the world is remembered through the name of one town in particular, Skibbereen, which is situated at the head of a small coastal inlet where the River Illen flows into the sea. In the late 1840s, it suffered terribly, but its story became famous because numerous journalists visited the town during the famine and then it was immortalised in a popular Irish ballad, Revenge for Skibbereen, written in the decades after these events. Now the story of Skibbereen is very different to y'all. The land around the town is in no way as fertile as the grain producing farms on either side of the Blackwater. At Skibbereen, the River Illen rises in hills to the north of the town and flows through far less fertile ground. The Illen did not carry great shipments of grain into Skibbereen like the Blackwater did into Yall. The hills of West Cork did, however, in good years produce a major surplus of potatoes which were then shipped up the coast from Skibbereen to Cork City. However, after the devastating outbreak of blight in 1846, the potato crop was more or less wiped out and exports from Skibbereen in that year were minimal. Therefore, unlike Yall, where food riots had been common, Skibbereen was comparatively quiet in the autumn of 1846. This in itself represented a grave problem, however. There were no riots because there was little food to riot over and, more importantly, little food to eat. By mid-September 1846, the Board of Works had organised major relief works in the area and there was little signs of growing tensions in Skibbereen. However, hunger, as we have seen, can push people into acts not normally engaged in and by the end of the month, the British government seemed to have been expecting trouble because a garrison of two officers and 60 men were sent to a temporary barracks erected in the town. Elsewhere, as we have seen, the rate of wages paid on public works like those being organised in Skibbereen, had caused trouble and a letter to the Cork Examiner from Skibbereen on September the 30th claimed that some labourers there who had been hired to break stones all day were only paid one shilling and threepence for six days work. That's a really, really low wage. This was made worse, the letter claimed, because they were all famished. Naturally, this created an explosive situation and indeed on the very day that this story appeared in the press, the men finally broke and refused to work anymore, saying death by starvation was preferable to what they were going through. This seems to have started resistance in and around Skibbereen, which lasted for a few weeks at least. Certainly on the 5th of October, a major demonstration took place in the town when thousands of starving labourers marched on Skibbereen, ten abreast, armed with shovels. They had come from the parish of Cahara, 10 kilometres to the north, and were demanding work from the local relief committee, which were meeting in the town that day. The military garrison was brought out, but the local clergy managed to defuse the situation before any violence broke out. But the pleas of the labourers were tragic. The labourers on that demonstration in Skibbereen informed the clergy. We have come because we are famished, because we have no food of any kind. We could suffer death from hunger ourselves, but can we look upon our children and our wives dying of hunger? The desperation voiced in this was genuine. 
a fact reinforced by the first famine-related death in Skibbereen two days later when a man called Jeremiah Hegarty perished. His death was clearly just going to be the first of many because newspapers were now reporting that the poor were fainting in the streets of the town from hunger. Soon, even the highly sought-after employment on the Government Board of Works were of little use to many as the physical labour involved was too taxing for their emaciated bodies. By the end of October, terrible reports began to emerge from Skibbereen, highlighting the unsuitability of the whole idea of providing heavy labour as a way to alleviate famine. Technically, it did provide money, but even then it was poorly organised and the work itself killed some of those who were starving to death. A visitor to Skibbereen in October met a woman who was trying to buy a coffin for her husband. After inquiring further, he discovered that the man had been employed on the public works but had not been paid for three weeks. The overseers had shown him little sympathy and whenever he stopped working from hunger, he was fined. With little option, he tried to continue on until eventually he collapsed and died from starvation and exhaustion. People like this were simply unable to work on the projects the Board of Works were engaging in. Furthermore, as winter weather set in, the starving poor had to spend days in the cold and rain and few had adequate clothing to protect them. By November, starvation was setting in on a large scale across West Cork. The doctor in Skibbereen reported being followed by large numbers of people now asking for coffins to bury their dead. He revealed a poignant story about giving money for the burial of two children, one of whom was heavily decomposed because his family had no money for his burial but did not want to lay him to rest without a coffin. A further illustration of the growing desperation was a burglary on the parish priest's house during which bacon and butter were stolen. Contemporary newspapers were normally void of any social analysis of crime, but on this occasion were quick to point out the desperate situation abroad in Skibbereen that provoked what would generally be considered a taboo crime. Overall, the situation now was revealing that the entire government response to famine in Ireland was inept. While the public works were unsuitable for starving people, Skibbereen did demarcate the start of a zone in the West where the government was willing to break its own rules and import small amounts of food because they recognised that in this region, private traders would not import grain. However, even for the people of Skibbereen who lived in this region, the government policy proved maddening. Depots were established, including one in Skibbereen itself, but the government stipulated they would not be opened until December the 28th, even though people were starving to death as early as October. One native of the town pondered what purpose it served other than to tantalise us with a sight of food we dare not touch. A private soup kitchen was funded by some of the town's wealthier citizens, but it could only feed 600 of the thousands of starving in and around the surrounding countryside. As freezing weather set in in late November, the situation in Skibbereen was frightful. The public works were totally unsuitable. The soup kitchen had at best a limited impact and the last port of call, the workhouse, was increasingly overwhelmed. Skibbereen Workhouse had been built under the 1838 Poor Law and completed in 1841. The Poor Law, however, was only designed to alleviate what you might call normal poverty and was not designed to cope with famine, so it was quickly totally overcrowded. By early December, the 10-acre complex refused to admit any more people, no matter how desperate they were, because it was so severely overcrowded. Having been built for 800 people, there was 1,169 people in the workhouse by January 1847. The disease spread rapidly through the weakened population and the stables had to be converted into a fever hospital. Very quickly, the structure was accommodating over 100 people with up to six sharing the same bed. Deaths soared. 67 people died in the first 15 days of December in this workhouse in Skibbereen. Terrible as this was, it's easy to see why people sought sanctuary inside the walls of such an institution. Outside, death was stalking the living. As news of the terrible conditions in the town began to filter out, a journalist from the Cork Examiner travelled down the coast from Cork City to Skibbereen to see exactly what was going on for himself. He arrived on Monday, December the 14th, and his words, I think, speak for themselves. Scarcely had I left the mail coach which conveyed me to this town yesterday and before my stay in the hotel had exceeded half an hour I heard the melancholy expression of grief which heralds the approach of a funeral. 
and hardly had the wailing of the last mourner ceased to echo in the town before it was caught by the attendance of a similar sad office which was again repeated by the assistance of a third funeral procession. Such sad scenes did my first half an hour in Skibbereen make me acquainted with. Indeed, in the face of terrible hunger and the increasing death toll, funerals were no longer being given the pride of place they once had in Irish society. One of the wealthier citizens in Skibbereen, pleading for aid in the pages of the Kerry Evening Post, reported, It's not an uncommon spectacle to see on the same table the remains of the parent and the children with no sheet or shroud but the miserable rags which they are in the habit of wearing by day and by night. Bodies were being left unburied for days and in one case at least one poor man was buried without a coffin. Once unimaginable, this would soon become a common fate. It was said that funerals were taking place at the rate of a dozen a day in the towns of Skibbereen, Ballydahob and Skull in West Cork by December. Dr O'Donovan, the town physician, a man totally overwhelmed, brought the Cork Examiner journalist on his rounds to one of the poorest areas of Skibbereen, a bridge town. What the journalist found there was the true face of famine in all its horrors. It deeply disturbed him and after writing up a long article he dispatched his account to Cork City along with a private note for his editors. In this note the journalist pleaded with the editor of the Cork Examiner to carry a truthful account of what he had seen and not to sanitise it for the public. He was keen that the world should hear about what famine looked like in Ireland. His editors agreed and his article preserved for posterity an account of what was happening in Skibbereen in December 1846. In the biting cold weather of early December, Dr Donovan had taken this journalist to the O'Leary household in Bridgetown, Skibbereen. The O'Learys appear to have been evicted on numerous occasions and they eventually took refuge in the ruins of an old house as Mrs O'Leary was heavily pregnant. The journalist takes up the story. The first house we entered belonged to a man named Jerry O'Leary. This miserable cabin was totally roofless and admitted the rain and wind with as much facility as if the family were located in the open street. And notwithstanding this circumstance, it was here that the wife of this poor man was delivered of a child. It was here in this roofless, shelterless hut, this mere enclosure, that she endured the pains of labour and it was out of this den that she was compelled to go in the three days after to seek subsistence for herself and family. The journalist explained how this had come to pass in what must have been a somewhat frequent enough experience. O'Leary, the husband, had previously taken possession of an unoccupied tenement, the proprietor of which was compelled to seek relief in the fever hospital, but on his return he was of course ejected and forced to take up his quarters in the deserted hovel of a deceased inhabitant. After visiting a few houses where he witnessed similar deprivation, the journalist continued his account. The next house that I went into was held by a man called Neil, who had worked on the public roads, but was compelled from sickness and exhaustion to resign that employment. Neil lay on the ground labouring under a dropsical complaint and unable to supply himself with a morsel of food or drink. While terribly sick, the Neil family must also have been traumatised. A few days earlier, Dr Donovan had passed the house and found a truly terrible sight. He told the reporter he had called into the house and inquired about one of the children. The account opened with the doctor's pretty blunt question. If Pat were dead, and a voice from the interior replied... I want some relief, sir. He, the doctor, entered the house and saw the boy stretched dead, the father lying alongside him, suffering from dropsy and unable to rise, and the other members of the family similarly circumstanced. Accounts of people being too sick and weak to remove the dead bodies of their deceased relatives are not uncommon. These people had to lie there, themselves close to death, with a corpse of a family member staring them in the face. The Cork Examiner's deeply disturbing article recalled many stories from Skibbereen, but the final account of a woman called Norrie Kettigan stood out for me. The journalist who walked down through what must have seemed like a dying town wrote an account how Norrie was suffering with all the members of her family under violent fever. Out of this habitation death has summoned two of the family within the last ten days and from all appearance it will be the scene of death's release to the remaining inmates. While many of the rich in Skibbereen had provided money for the soup kitchen, the details of Norrie Kettigan's family revealed some to be utterly ruthless, a terrible display of man's inhumanity to man. 
Unsurprisingly, the Kedigans, like so many others, had fallen behind in their rent, but their landlord showed no mercy. Presumably too afraid of disease to physically evict them from the property, he instead had the windows and doors of the house removed. This was done, no doubt, in the hope that it would force the Kedigans to go and die elsewhere. Judging on the account, all it did was make their final hours even more difficult. Unsurprisingly in this environment, Manny and Skibbereen were now just desperate to emigrate, to escape death. But most could not even afford food, let alone the price of a passage to America or England. The wealthiest, those who paid for the relief, were though beginning to leave in increasing numbers, which only served to increase poverty and starvation in the town. The stories of Skibbereen carried by the Cork Examiner reached huge audiences as several other newspapers syndicated them, including the Manchester Guardian. However, it did not alleviate the situation. Indeed, it only continued to get worse. The approach of the new year of 1847 offered literally no hope whatsoever for Skibbereen. The Cork Examiner journalist who had written the original story returned to the town on Christmas Eve 1846 to be informed that between December the 3rd and December the 24th, that's just three weeks, 169 people had died in this town alone. This did not include the workhouse or the surrounding districts. Skibbereen was a town which had just fewer than 10,000 people in the census of 1841. This means that it had lost 1.5% of its population in 21 days, an average of over 10 funerals every day right up until Christmas. However, worse was to come. To alleviate the problems, the British government needed to intervene, but they were woefully ill-prepared. Many of the officials and politicians themselves were no doubt moved on some level. For example, Charles Trevelyan would write to Randolph Routh in Dublin after receiving accounts from West Cork at the end of December saying, Skibbereen is the most awful I have yet seen. However, these words are somewhat hollow. His failure to oversee the purchasing of food from the previous August left the government without adequate stocks of food even for the depots they had agreed to open in the West. Well aware of this, by December, Trevelyan and others were now laying the blame on international markets, basically refusing to accept it was their fault. However, politicians like George Benthink were pointing out at this stage that there was a glut of food on the American market at this point. Tragically, accessing this in midwinter was very difficult, as crossing the Atlantic was nigh on impossible. Furthermore, the British administration had proved completely inflexible in their ill-conceived plans so that even in Skibbereen, during appalling suffering, food depots did not open until the agreed date of December 28th. Part of the reasoning behind this was because they were now aware there wasn't enough food. By this stage, their whole strategy of famine relief was clearly a failure and some officials were now seeing this. For example, Randolph Routh, the man who was overseeing the relief policy in Ireland, no longer really believed in it and was increasingly dejected. Other officials in England seemed almost disinterested. In December, the Relief Committee of Skibbereen had written to London asking for something known as a Queen's Letter, where the reigning monarch Victoria would publicly endorse a fundraising effort for Skibbereen. This naturally would have helped hugely. However, the Home Secretary, Sir George Grey, flatly refused pointing out that the Relief Committee of Skibbereen had not first launched their own appeal as protocol dictated in such affairs. This assistance to follow protocol had cost people's lives already and would cost a hell of a lot more. While the stories of Yall and Skibbereen are just two communities, hundreds, maybe thousands of other communities across Ireland with their own dynamics faced similar levels of starvation. While this podcast has very much focused on the local and the small scale, Before I finish, I do want to talk about some overall statistics which do indicate the scale of the problem that was now unfolding and the inadequacies of the solutions being proposed. So first of all, the Board of Works, which was set up to oversee the employment schemes, which would theoretically provide money for the poor to buy food, was extraordinarily bloated by the end of 1846. It was employing 444,000 people at the cost of half a million pounds a month by December. It was not fit for purpose. The starving poor at this point were in no position to carry out the heavy work which the Board of Works was often engaged in. The chairman, 
Colonel Harry Jones accepted this by Christmas 1846 when he wrote to Trevelyan in London saying their bodily strength gone their spirits depressed they have not the power to exert themselves sufficiently to earn the ordinary day's wages. Now a new policy as we will see in coming episodes was being devised but in many respects it was too late. The Board of Works had completely undermined the Irish economy. By December, 10% of the Irish workforce were now working on schemes organised by the Board of Works, which were, by and large, useless, such as building roads to nowhere. They added little to the overall economy and, crucially, did not create food. This problem had been flagged as early as September in the Kerry Evening Post when it predicted that a good deal of harm would arise from this practice in reference to the Board of Works. The harm they are referring to is that as labourers left farms, the rural economy in Ireland basically collapsed. In many cases, farmers could no longer pay the wages, but the long-term consequences of this were very, very dangerous. If labourers were not working the land, crops were not being planted, and there would literally be no harvest at all in 1847. However, for many of the poor, the harvest of 1847 was just too far away to worry about. They were more concerned about getting food in the following day or week in late 1846. The government could perhaps have stepped in and directly paid farm wages in late 1846. However, this would have run anathema to their policy of not interfering in the economy. Organisationally, however, there's no reason to see why they could not have carried out this policy given they were overseeing the employment of 10% of the workforce by Christmas 1846. The situation in the workhouses is also worth mentioning because this flagged another problem coming down the line which we will have to address in future shows. By Christmas 1846, half of Ireland's workhouses, like that at Skibbereen, were completely overcrowded. Death rates were soaring as disease which inevitably follows in the wake of starvation, spread like wildfire in what were very crowded conditions. However, many were so desperate they just continued to flock to them. As you can imagine, the future in Ireland by this stage was very, very bleak, and the fact that 1847 would become known to history as Black 47 speaks volumes as to what lies ahead for us. In the next episode, we will return to Skibbereen for the early months of 1847. Normally I would say I hope you've enjoyed this show, but perhaps it is something you would find more interesting than enjoyable. If you want to get that bonus content and support the series, you can do so by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. That's patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Irish podcast. Until next time, slon. <laughs>